All right, this is our third and last video on knee and leg uh, injuries and uh, disease uh, for the PA uh, first year students. So now we're on posterior cruciate ligament or PCL tears. So we already talked about ACL tears. PCL tears are uh, less common. The, the PCL is the primary restraint to posterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. Okay, so the PCL takes a course where it comes more or less kind of like this, right? So it prevents the tibia from translating posteriorly. And here you can see um, the examiner about to do a posterior drawer test where they try to uh, stabilize uh, the uh, femur and then push the tibia posteriorly. It's less common than an ACL tear uh, and it frequently can occur due to this type of force such as a dashboard hitting the tibia uh, but it's also frequently an athletic injury. So the posterior drawer test um, being shown here uh, you can also get something called a sag sign so you put the patient into this position where you're doing a posterior drawer test and you look to see if the uh, tibia is sort of in this anterior position with the tubercle here or is the tibia sitting sitting back here uh, and sort of sagged back to this position and you compare it to the contralateral knee. MRI imaging is very good to help confirm this. Now isolated PCL tears are actually frequently treated non-surgically. Now if you have a combination injury, ACL, PCL, or PCL, LCL, or maybe three or four ligaments, well then actually PCL repair or, uh, or more importantly reconstruction becomes very important. Uh, but isolated PCL tears actually are frequently treated non-surgically. All right, on to collateral ligament tears. So the collateral ligaments are these and we'll just simplify things. I think the actual anatomy gets a little bit more complicated, but we'll just simplify to the medial collateral and lateral collateral ligaments. And these images are all from your textbook, the AOS Essentials. So the MCL stabilizes the knee to valgus forces, right? So here's your knee. It's preventing the MCL here is preventing the knee from a val excuse me, from a valgus force. Come back up here from a valgus force. So it's preventing the knee oops, from buckling this way. So if you're trying to make the knee go this way, it's a check rein to prevent that. So if you imagine if you didn't have this, if you didn't have this MCL here, this knee could potentially you know, buckle into valgus. And when you do your valgus stress, stress test, I don't know why these little lines on the side you can actually that's not really drawn well we'll draw it like this right so you have this huge opening here so that what's what would happen is if you did not have an MCL for instance on the other side LCL stabilizes the knee to varus forces so here's the LCL and that's preventing a varus force from bending the knee this way okay um, both are extra-articular ligaments, and if they're torn, this could result in varus or valgus instability, depending on which one's torn. Um, so if you have tenderness along the course of the ligament, uh, and if you have dynamic instability, that is, if you put them through this varus or valgus stress test and it's positive, like the knee opens up, like I drew in the previous little sketch, uh, that could mean that uh, it's torn and you always compare to the other knee. Uh, if you want to actually try to palpate the LCL you have to put the patient into this sort of figure of four position and um, uh, that puts the LCL under tension and you can feel it. If necessary uh, MRI can be obtained to confirm your diagnosis. Uh, now in isolation these frequently can be managed with bracing and rehabilitation. Uh, especially MCL tears, which are pretty common. But um, they can require surgery in cases of multiple ligament injuries. So again, if you have ACL, LCL, or ACL, MCL, PCL, or whatever combination, um, then they often do require surgical uh, treatment. 
All right, tendon disorders and uh, bursitis. So constellation of stuff here. So quadriceps and patellar tendonitis um, usually are a kind of overuse or overload syndrome. Um, so if you have infrapatellar uh, tendonitis, this is uh, also called a jumper's knee. Uh, and this is one of these things where, again, you can put a, you should be able to put a finger on and identify where the pain is. So here you can see the examiner is localizing the pain right at the inferior pole of the patella. And the tendon is here, so this is likely infrapatellar tendonitis. And um, if you had insertional quadriceps tendonitis, that would be at the superior pole where the quad tendon is inserting. And this can be treated with rest, stretching exercises, physical therapy. Contrasted to quadriceps and patellar tendon rupture. Now, keep in mind, many people refer to this as the patellar ligament. That is, this is the patellar ligament. Now, anatomically, I think that actually makes more sense. Right? I mean, you, you, it's, it, it's a structure connecting bone to bone. Right? So structures connecting bone to the bone are usually called ligaments, right? But for some reason, we usually call it the tendon, and the patella is considered a sesamoid bone within the quadriceps. So both terms are used interchangeably. But keep in mind, this is a much worse problem than patellar tendonitis. These frequently occur with a missed step or a, maybe a fall onto the knee, and then the patient says they suddenly felt the knee give way. Now, if you remember in a couple of um, videos ago, we talked about fractures, and we said patella fractures are often uh, exhibit uh, clinical signs and symptoms like a patellar or quadriceps tendon rupture, right? Um, so uh, remember, clinically, they can present with the same type of injury. They can be associated with fluoroquinolone use, interestingly, like Achilles tendon rupture. So you might want to just ask that question uh, and see if it's, uh, if, if it's in the history. Like patella fractures, it can result in loss of extensor mechanism. The key thing, this is very important, this is diagnostic, you have to look for this. If a patient cannot hold a straight leg raise against gravity, that is, you tell them, lay down supine and just lift your leg off the bed. If they can't get the heel off the table up into the air, you have to really strongly consider this diagnosis or patella fracture um, because they may have loss of extensor function. This is very disabling. Now you can temporize this in a knee immobilizer, but this is actually not something that heals well on its own. Interestingly, Achilles tendon ruptures you can treat non-surgically, um, but uh, these are uh, almost always uh, indicated for surgical repair. It's not a complicated repair, but without it, uh, oftentimes the patients never recover full um, extensor, extensor function. Iliotibial band friction syndrome. So uh, uh, this is kind of a figure shown from the book. This, this is uh, something that causes lateral sided knee pain. So if the patient comes up to you and clearly can isolate pain to the lateral side of the knee, perhaps over the lateral epicondyle, uh, you have to uh, consider this. Um, they, it's caused due to friction and inflammation between the iliotibial band and the lateral epicondyle. Uh, this is something very frequently associated with uh, distance running. And it's treated with physical therapy, strengthening, stretching, uh, and most importantly, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And sometimes you can uh, consider an injection under the iliotibial band into that space where it's causing friction, if not improved. But very little role for surgery. Pez anserine bursitis. Remember, the pez anserine is the sartorius um, gracilis semi semitendinosus inserting onto the intermedial part of the proximal tibia. Uh, and pre and infrapatellar bursitis, which is actually pretty common on the anterior part of the knee, usually from chronic pressure or friction. So certainly an infrapatellar bursitis can happen from constantly kneeling on, on the ground. Um, this is an inflammatory condition, and the bursa is there as a potential space or sort of shock absorber. And if the knee feels like it's getting irritated and the bursa is getting um, uh, mechanically irritated, it fills up with fluid. And it can look like an effusion. 
uh, but because it's outside of the joint, it usually does not affect joint motion as much as a real joint effusion. So the clinical exam is a little bit different than a joint effusion. These are things that can get infected, and oftentimes in hospital practice we see um, cases of infected or septic bursitis, and oftentimes those need to get drained. But uh, aseptic uh, bursitis can be treated with um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, rest, avoiding pressure and injury, but sometimes we have to drain them, even if they're sterile, sometimes we drain them in the office, but they're, they're infected, that could require surgical drainage, and sometimes we have to inject them to get the inflammation to go down. All right, so hopefully these objectives were, were uh, met. Understand the pathology, I'm sorry, pathophysiology assessment management sequelae of knee arthritis, that of bone injuries to the knee, soft tissue injuries of the knee, and tendon disorders and bursitis of the knee. All right, so those are our four main topics covered over these three videos. Thank you very much.